Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Thursday. This is Seattle Now. If you think housing in Seattle can't get any more expensive, I am so sorry. Rents are skyrocketing, and our reemergence from the pandemic has a lot to do with it. Redfin Chief Economist Daryl Fairweather will explain why in a minute. But first, let's get you caught up. Some Seattle police officers routinely refused to wear masks during the height of the pandemic and weren't disciplined for ignoring public health directives. A report released by the Office of Inspector General said masking violations went beyond individual officers breaking rules and revealed serious culture problems in the department. Beyond COVID spread, the report warned that a culture of letting staff break rules could pose bigger problems for the department in the future. That chill you're feeling, that's a persistent flow of cold Canadian air. The National Weather Service says Seattle is having its third coldest April since Led Zeppelin played the Kingdom. That was back in 77, by the way. And don't expect it to warm up. We're stuck in this pattern for a while. Forecast says high temperatures will be in the mid-50s to low 60s through the weekend. Socks and sandals, people, this is your time to shine. And Seahawks fans will be watching closely to see what the team does in tonight's NFL draft. The Hawks have the ninth overall pick, which they got from the Broncos when they traded away Russell Wilson. No guarantee they'll actually use it. The Seahawks have a reputation for making deals and trading picks on draft day. And no guarantee they'll get a superstar if they do pick ninth. Russell Wilson was the 75th player drafted back in 2012. $2,117. That's the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment in the city, according to Apartment List. In a place as expensive as Seattle, nobody wants to hear that housing is getting even more expensive. But it is, and fast. New data published by Seattle-based real estate company Redfin found that rents across the country went up 17% in the last year. Of course, Seattle saw an even bigger increase. 29%. Daryl Fairweather is here to help us understand the state of the rental market right now. She's the chief economist at Redfin. Daryl, really good to have you back. Thanks. Thank you for having me. We mentioned a 29% increase in rent in Seattle, and that is just stunning and a huge number if you're already spending a big chunk of your income on rent. Put this in context for us. Is it normal to see this big of an increase? This is not normal to see this large of an increase in rent in such a short amount of time. And it's got to be particularly jarring coming out of the pandemic. During the pandemic, rents were pretty stable. And now as things are reopening, they are just shooting up almost as if they're making up for last, lost time. Yeah, the pandemic has really changed the landscape of nearly everything in our lives. So the rental market, I guess, should be included in that. But how specifically did the rental market get impacted here? During the pandemic, the rental market was pretty much at a standstill. A lot of people were leaving the city looking for more space or just to get away since they could work remotely. And plenty of landlords lost tenants and didn't end up relisting their units. They wanted to just get out of renting altogether because of the eviction moratorium and just the uncertainty that was going on during the pandemic. Now people are returning to cities, including Seattle, and they are all fighting for the few number of rental units that are left. And the new rental units that are coming on the market are often priced very high because there are people coming in from places like San Francisco that are used to paying even higher rents. That is fascinating, Daryl. And I'm hearing a couple of things here. One, that smaller landlords just got out of the market because it was too much of a hassle for them. But also that people getting back out there and reemerging is part of why rents are going up. Explain that a little bit more. Sure. So during the pandemic, plenty of people moved in with family or just got out of the Seattle area altogether. And now people are moving back. And especially millennials are interested in having a place of their own. They don't want to live in their parents' basement anymore. Maybe they want to start a family. And that often requires a space of your own. So millennials are the biggest generation. They're all looking for a home at the same time, whether it's a rental or a for sale home. And that is driving up demand for housing across the board. And unfortunately, there just aren't enough units to go around, especially in a place like Seattle. There isn't 
abundant land to build on. So the only way to increase the supply is to change zoning laws and get more dense housing built. And that's just been an uphill battle. Like we talked about, prices in the city are going up much faster than average, although there are cities where rents are going up even higher than here. What are some of the factors fueling high prices here in the city? One of them you mentioned was people coming in from cities like San Francisco who don't necessarily have the same sticker shock that somebody around here might have. Yes, anywhere that Californians are moving is guaranteed to be a place where rents are going up. That includes Portland, Austin, Florida, Phoenix, all of all those places have seen sharp increases in rents and home prices. Seattle is a pretty expensive market, you know, when you look at it from a national scale, but it is the number one destination for people from the Bay Area who are leaving the state of California. So that high earning tech money is just driving up demand for housing and also rents. Hmm. Well, and you mentioned this at the top as well. When you talked about landlords, smaller landlords getting out of the biz, the city has also lost 10,000 rental units of housing over the past year. Is this something you're tracking and you've noticed as well? I am curious about the impact of losing those housing units. Yes. So during the pandemic, the one place where we saw a pretty strong increase in the supply of homes for sale was in condo units. Uh, Plenty of people were leaving the dense city centers, moving out somewhere more spacious, and people were leaving their rental units behind too. And some of those condos that went up on the market are now not available for rent anymore. Those kind of mom and pop landlords have gotten out of the business or at least downsized in terms of how many units they hold. So It was good for a moment if you were looking to buy a condo. Now condo prices are actually shooting back up just because of the overwhelming demand for homes, uh, whether it's rentals or for sale. So that kind of window of when you could get um, a cheap condo is closed. And also that window when you could get a cheap apartment has closed. Now everything is just more expensive. It's kind of the story of the economy more broadly. I'm curious who you think has the power here, bigger corporations or small landlords? That's an interesting question. I don't I don't think either of them are are in a position of too much power. I think that they are just kind of following the market and noticing how much demand there is. If you have an affordable price rental and you put it on the market, you're going to have a line out the door of people wanting to rent that place. So people, whether they're corporations or mom and pop, take notice of that. I have heard anecdotally that if that the corporations are, are less willing to negotiate on rent in the mom and pop, especially if it's a lease renewal, they are more focused on the bottom line, whereas a smaller landlord may... Um, may just want a tenant who's a good tenant that they can rely on to pay on time. So I think they're the smaller landlords maybe give up a little bit of their power just so they have um, a more reliable tenant. Interesting point. I'm curious where you think you have to go in Seattle or in the area, because you can't go anywhere in Seattle for cheap housing. That's clear. But how far out do you have to go to find what you would consider to be affordable rent? Everything is relative. So if you are actually looking to the outskirts of Seattle or one of the surrounding counties, it may seem a lot more affordable compared to the city of Seattle, but the people who live there are going to be complaining about how much rents have gone up. So everything is getting more expensive, but from your own personal perspective, the more flexible you can be, the more adaptable you can be and expand the geographies of where you're living, willing to live, um, the more power you'll have in terms of being able to find a home that's affordable. Sure, sure. You know, we talk about housing a lot on this show, and it always comes back to the same thing. There just aren't enough places to live for the number of people who want to live here. When you think about this, is there anything we can do to address this issue other than just building more housing? Building housing is really the only thing that's going to solve the underlying problem other than making it less desirable to live in Seattle. I don't think anybody really wants that. (laughs) It is like a good problem that Seattle is so attractive that people keep wanting to move there. And I think the best thing that the city can do is just to keep planning for that growth, keep assuming that growth is going to come and build for the future. It's fascinating, though, what happens in a place where young, low-income earners cannot survive anymore. Maybe there's a conversation about rent control in here, as one of our city council members has repeatedly brought up. 
You know, I think there's always a place for some rent control. You never want the landlords to have too much power. You wouldn't want them to be able to evict somebody for no reason at all or to be able to raise the rent, um, you know, arbitrarily. So I think there's always um, some place for that. But again, I think we should be solving the underlying problem of making sure there's enough housing units in the places people want to live. And another solution might be to make it so that to expand transit so that at least if people do have to move farther away, they have an easy way to get into the city and keep doing their jobs. Sure, sure. All right. Prediction time, Daryl. Mm-hmm. How do you envision things developing over the next six months or so here? Should we expect rents to keep getting more and more expensive? Will it stabilize at any point in the near future? I think rents will keep going up. So if you are kind of debating whether you want to rent versus own, I think you should bank on rents continuing to increase. They may not increase as quickly as they are right now, but I think that they will continue to go up faster than overall inflation. Um, High mortgage rates are making for sale housing a little bit less competitive. And I think that that the overall for sale housing market will slow down. But all those potential buyers who are being priced out of for sale housing, um, they're going to go over to the rental market. Yeah. And like you brought up, Daryl, the condo market is coming back as well, which is a lower priced option for some people looking to get into their own space for sure. Daryl Fairweather, Chief Economist at Redfin, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Claire McGrain produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.